Mr. Everything, and I'm coming at you with another special edition of Starship Spotlight. The components. In this video, what we're going to be talking about are all the different various components that most of your ships have. Some have some and some have others, but the majority of these components that I'm going to list off will be found on the majority of the ships out there, 90% of them, with, with some variation, because some ships have a variation of each of these items. But this video is targeting those of you out there that have not been following Star Citizen for three years, and you might not be sure what the heck a certain item is. Now, what do they mean when they say this? And that's what this video is about. This video is going to be informative. It's going to fill you in on the basics. Uh, and I'm going to try to dig a little bit deeper into each item and kind of show you and tell you what its function is in the game and in the Persistent Universe. Because some of these components are specifically geared towards combat functions, where there's other components in your ship that are not related to combat in any way. Uh, but they're on your ship, and you need to know what their functions are, why you have them, and what's, what advantages are. And that's what this video is all about. This is going to be a non-formal, it's going to be informal tutorial on the details of all your different ship components. CIG uh, and Star Citizen is going to have each of these components modeled on your ship. You'll have the ability to change them. So you can take something off of your ship and you'll be able to turn around and plug a different model, a different manufacturer, a different class of that specific component. And in some cases, you'll even be able to change the size of the component. When you go to your ship stat page, it will say, let's say, it'll say thruster size 1 through 3 or thruster size 2 through 4 or something like that. So you should be able to place any of those components in those slots that, as long as they fit into the component slot on your ship. This component system actually works across all aspects of Star Citizen, not just ships, but we are focusing on ships today because you can add different components to your rifle, like maybe a barrel or what have you, a uh, scope or anything like that, right, on, on your uh, FPS tools also. But we're talking about ships today, and I want to go down each of the components, but I also wanted to mention that not only can you adjust the size, uh, purchase different components from different manufacturers that might be that might have different characteristics, but you yourself as a player in the game can take these components uh, and you can do what they have termed overclocking. And what that basically means is you go in and you adjust the stats of your component. So you can make it go faster while overheating, or you could say, I want it to be cooler, so we'll go slower, or I want it to have a better signature, or I want it to have more damage and less power in consumption. You can adjust all these different characteristics of each and every component to allow you to uh, not only modify your ship by purchasing the appropriate component, but you yourself can modify that component. And those players, another thing about components, those players out there that are skilled at overclocking, they know what they're doing, they know how to adjust the component to meet anyone's specific needs, will have a guaranteed job in the verse by offering their services to overclock your equipment. So if you are good at that, advertise it. Make some money on the side. All right, let's talk about the components and where you might find them and what they're going to do for you on your ship. The first thing I want to talk about is engines. Now, this is not in any specific order. I basically just have 
all the components on a list and I want to go down the list. And uh, so if I jump around a little bit, it's only because that's the way I typed it up on my list. So bear with me. Engines. You have a variety of different types of engines and they each perform a different role. Uh, first of all, you have a main thruster, right? Your main thruster is the engine. Okay, the engine provides you your thrust to move your ship from point A to point B. Attached to the engine, the main engine, is a new thing that they've just switched to or will switch to in the new flight model, your maneuvering thrusters. So the main engine thrust will be piped to your maneuvering thrusters a lot like if you're familiar with the Harrier. The Harrier has a main engine but it also has these thrusters that the thrust from the engine is redirected out these nozzles giving it the ability to like do vertical takeoff and landing and things like this. Well that is exactly the model that they're going to with the thrusters. Okay so with the maneuvering thrusters you have your main thruster and then you got the maneuvering thrusters used to be a separate component but those are now nozzles that redirect thrust from your main thruster giving you maneuvering thrusters in just a minute. There's also the jump drive and then there is also the quantum drive. Okay, these are all drives inside your ship and the power plant is, can be fueled a variety of different ways. There's, the, there's a fission power plant a fusion power plant and an antimatter power plant. Uh, the antimatter is more dangerous to use, but you'll get more power output. Fusion is the most common. That's what everybody's got. That's what everybody's using. It's modern. The fission power plant is what you might find on some of your really old ships. They're not going to put out a whole lot of power based on the, the technology of the fission. Fission's lower than fusion and then it goes to antimatter which is a little bit more dangerous and you'll find and so you would have to find for fission and fusion I do believe the fuel is the same but for the antimatter power plant you will need to have antimatter fuel and that's limited on where you can find that thrusters okay we talked about the main thruster that's your think of it like this that is your main rocket engine in the back. That's what, you know, like a jet has a main engine. That's what it is. And you might have more than one. You know, you might have multiple engines, but they're, those are your main engines. And those are what's going to give you your speed going forward. Now, if you wanted to stop, you just flip your ship around 180 degrees and apply your main thruster. That stops you. Okay. Uh, if you do not do that, if you try to just use your maneuvering thrusters to slow you down it will be a lot slower in the new in the new flight model there's also something called afterburner basically uh, thrusters you have this ability called boost basically applies more thrust to your main thruster slash afterburners but if you're redirecting it through your maneuvering thrusters You'll actually be able to turn sharper, tighter. You'll be able to stop a turn faster. You'll be able to spin around and stop yourself uh, when you boost. Now, what boost is doing is it's using up your fuel. Uh, there's this thing called, in current model, there's something called boost fuel. But I think they're going to do away with boost fuel because uh, it's basically just what your main thruster is just burning up fuel is what it's doing. So it's just going to give you a lower fuel time. Now my understanding is that uh, thruster fuel is replenished over time based on incoming fuel scoops. But we'll wait and see how that works. The jump drive. Okay, jump drive creates a bubble uh, around your ship and allows you to transition into a warp gate or a jump gate. Uh, without a jump drive, you can't fly into a jump gate. Um, I don't know if it'll destroy you or if you'll just fly through it. Don't know about that, but if you have a jump drive and it is spooled up 
and you have that bubble, the jump bubble, around your ship, when you fly into that jump gate, now you're going to enter into the wormhole where you can transition to another star system. That's what the jump gates are for. It's for tra traveling from system to system. And you need a jump drive to do that. All but about three ships currently have jump drives. You're going to see jump drives on any ship that's bigger than a snub fighter. Okay, then there's something called quantum drive. And my understanding is every single ship has quantum drive. And, what, and quantum drive uses quantum fuel produced just for quantum drives. And what, so quantum drive is, it's a drive that will accelerate your ship to point to the speed of light. Uh, now that means you're going to be traveling from planet to planet inside the same system using quantum drive. If you just use your main thrusters, it would take you months to get there. But if you were to use your quantum drive, you're going point to the speed of light, it'll only take you minutes to get there. And those were the engines. Now let's talk about the fuel, because fuel kind of ties in with engines. Uh, there is, of course, jump fuel. There's fuel specifically used to fuel your jump drive. There's quantum fuel, as we mentioned already. And then, of course, there's thruster fuel, the, the main, man, your main thrusters. And currently, there's something called boost fuel, which I think they're getting rid of and going to just thruster fuel. So when you do your afterburners, you burn the main fuel. There's something on the front of most ships uh, for scoops. Those are the fuel scoops. And what those do, they look like big air intakes, right? Well, what they do is they scoop up ambient hydrogen particles in space. I know there's, I know his, realistically, there's not very many hydrogen particles, but this is a game, okay? So just go with it. The hydrogen in space scooped up and it's reprocessed into purified fuel for your thrusters. Not quantum or jump. Those you will have to purchase or have a special processor to process that, like if you have a fuel ship like a Starfarer or something. There's also something on a lot of the military ships called the refuel nozzle. They're basically, uh, it'll, and I, I assume some of the non-military ships might have this, but if you're flying out there and you're about to run out of fuel and a, uh, uh, a Starfarer flies by and he says, hey, do you need, you need a hand? I've got fuel. What they do is they connect their refueling boom to your refueling nozzle, and it allows you to refuel in midair slash mid space, where you won't have to go land at a refueling point because you might be out. You know, you might need AAA to come out there and help you out. Okay, so the scoops pick up the fuel re so that your processor on your ship can process it and refine fuel. Now, if you don't have a fuel processing plant, you can still use that. Hydrogen is just considered unrefined fuel, and it might cause a little damage to your thrusters. Uh, but the more a fuel is refined, uh, the longer it's been processed, the more, the cleaner it is, and the less damage it will cause to drives or engines. The next thing we have is aerodynamics. And what aerodynamics is talking about is the flight worthiness of a plane, okay? And I, I'm not saying a ship, of a plane, of, a, sh of a, a ship that can enter an atmosphere, and will it be able to fly and land? There are some ships out there that can't land on a planet. And if they can land on a planet, they're relying 100% on thrusters, where an aerodynamic ship would and I and I the there's two versions of, of aerodynamics you have streamlined and non-streamlined okay a streamlined ship actually has flight controls so they'll actually have ailerons rudders you know elevators things like that so so they will actually be able to use the atmosphere traveling over the wings for lift and they'll be able to land like an airplane where a non-streamlined ship, it's like a box, 
you know, like a uh, star fair or something like that. It's just a big, huge brick in the air. It will fly and it can land, but it's relying heavily on its thrusters. That's aerodynamics. Okay, next one. Since we're talking about landing on a planet, we got landing gear. Now, landing gear, you'll notice uh, there's various styles, types, sizes, and shapes of landing gear. The two main categories of landing gear are skids or fixed skid landing gear and wheels. Now, why would you say, why would a helicopter or any VTOL aircraft need wheels, right? It just doesn't make sense, right? Well, that's not true. So when a, when a ship like your Hornet is landed on the deck of a carrier, it has skids. And when your M50 is landed, it has wheels. Okay, so now you're trying to move that ship around on a carrier deck. Uh, you're trying to move it. Well, if it's on a skid, it's not moving anywhere. You have to jack it up onto these little pallets that have wheels on them, so or you know these uh, skid pallets, skid, what are they called? Skid wheels, skid wheels. You jack up your skid, put them on these special devices called wheels, right? And you and then you can move that ship around if you didn't want to fire it up and have it hover over there. So like if you're on a carrier deck and you got to rearrange all these so basically that puts the carrier deck crew to a lot of extra effort to move these ships around where if they had wheels they could just roll it around it could drive on the surface drive it like a car you know around the uh carrier deck or what have you and you can reposition yourself and the crew can act you know if you put it in neutral the crew can move that ship around using a uh a tow, a tow truck, you know, where with a, with a skidded, you can't. Now, some advantages for a skid over a wheel is that the skids are a lot more durable, right? They're not going to pop, you know, you're not going to break any, you're not going to, the, the wheels aren't, well, most of the wheels are probably going to be solid rubber anyway, they're not going to be filled with air, but uh, the skids can land in any surface. You could be out in the snow, you could be out in sand, rock, the moon, wherever. The skid will be able to land. Wheels traditionally are on ships that are aerodynamic that fly in with a streamlined surface and they're landing like a plane. Uh, now, I'm sure, let's use the M50 as an example. I'm sure it can hover and it can land in space, but in an atmosphere, does it, are its thrusters strong enough to hold up its weight? I don't know. So it might have to land like an aerodynamic plane. And if that's the case, that's a, that's a disadvantage. All right, now we're moving on to scanners. When I say scanner, basically it's a, it, there are multiple different types of devices that reach out, identify contacts, let you know the contact exists, and it relays that information back to you. But it's not always just contacts. Sometimes, like especially on a mining vessel, you'll have scanners that can scan the asteroids to give you their chemical components or their mineral components. So you can decide if you want to mine that iron out of that asteroid or what have you. So you're going to have a variety, an unlimited number of different types of scanning devices. But the main ones for your ship is radar. Okay, that's, uh, that's you being able to uh, broadcast a signal that bounces off of a item in space that when it bounces back to your ship, your ship identifies that as a blip or a contact. Then you've also got uh, image recognition. So your ship actually has cameras. It locks on visually to your contact and identifies that and gives you a an identification like Scythe or 300i or what have you. Uh, some missiles that have infrared, not infrared, uh, 
image recognition when you lock on to a ship it locks on 300 i and then when you shoot it it chases down that 300 i it doesn't use infrared or radar so it's better at defeating like flares and chaff because it's not looking for flares or chaff it's looking for that image it's looking for the 300 i image so image recognition missiles are a lot better uh, at maintaining their locks than either radar or infrared. Okay, infrared sensor. That's a sensor that detects uh, heat. You know, space is a very cold place, so it would be very easy to, to notice a ship flying by with its plume of fire flying out the back of it. So infrared sensors are very effective in space. There are some ships out there that have infrared dampening uh, on their thrusters, that and they try to fly with very low energy emissions and also in space you can get to point a to point b by not using any en engine you throttle up to a certain speed cut your engine you just drift the entire way and so infrared will not be able to see that ship very easily um, i'm sure it's power plants creating power and providing energy for that ship which is causing heat but there are ways to mask that and to uh, reduce that signature. And that's what, um, so infrared might not be the best to detect in space, but in most cases, infrared is passive. So you're not sending out a signal bouncing off another object, pinging it back like sonar to let you know that there's a target out there like radar would be doing. Where infrared, you're just looking for heat. Uh, there is such a thing as uh, active infrared, but and you might or might not have that, but that's basically like night vision or thermal imaging. Uh, and if you use like an active infrared, you're using like an infrared spotlight, which you don't really need to use in space, I don't, wouldn't think. Okay, then we move on to the computer systems. You have a, a large number of computers on a ship. The, there is uh, the, the ship... And, and a multi-crew ship, single seat ship, it doesn't matter. You have a lot of functions going on on that ship. And there are so many calculations that need to be processed that it's impossible for all these to, to be run by an engineer or, or a pilot. Uh, you actually need these computers to do all this for you. One of them is navigation. Okay, it's, it's going to help you plot courses. It's going to do calculations on fuel consumption and uh, route and waypoints and like gravitational pulls of various planets and the objects will let you it'll help you decide on how to get to point a from point b right you'll have a targeting computer now this a targeting computer helps you when you are dog biting uh giving you a like a lead pip reticle letting you know where to shoot for your rounds to hit a specific target. It also helps in locking your missiles. It identifies all the hostiles versus the friendlies. And it might even, if it's a good enough computer, might allow you to lock onto multiple targets. Uh, sometimes in turreted weapons, like uh, larger multi-crew ships, each turret has their own targeting computer. Uh, so there can be computers all over, uh, targeting computers. Then you have something called the ECM or the electronic countermeasures or your E-WAR package, uh, however you want to call it. Uh, this helps in defending against hostiles that are trying to use electronic warfare to disable your computer systems or hack your computer systems. Uh, like, hypothetically, if a hostile pirate wanted to hack a merchant's targeting computer or his autopilot and causing him to uh, just fly straight so that they can go dock with him and board him. Those merchants want to make sure they have an ECM, which is an electronic countermeasure, to prevent external hacking. Okay. There's something called ADS and also something called an autopilot. Those are all pretty familiar. Basically, uh, it's you allow the computer to run your ship for you. A lot of times this takes over when you're landing 
or if you're docking, uh, or if you are just flying from point A to point B, you can put it on autopilot and then you can get up and roam around inside your ship. IFCS. Okay, IFCS is your flight control system. Uh, it's your intelligent flight control system. What it does is artificially places limitations on your ship to prevent you from killing yourself. Um, it, it prevents your ship from flying so fast that if you were to make a sharp turn that you would go splat against the windshield. It prevents that. It prevents you from... Uh, now you can disable this. You can. Uh, IFCS has this ability to turn things off. Uh, it also allows control of your thrusters so when you point your ship using your flight stick, you say, I want to fly over towards this asteroid. The ship understands, the IFCS figures out what you're trying to do, and it redirects your nozzles of your maneuvering thrusters in such a way to cause your ship to turn in that direction and adjusts the thrust to each of these different nozzles to get you moving in that direction. So basically, it's maneuvering your thrusters for you, and it listens to your input based on your throttle and your stick and your yaw and your pitch. It listens to all that what you're trying to do, and then it translates that into what it needs to do with the throttle and the thrusters to get your ship to do what you're asking it to do. That's your IFCS. So if you get your IFCS damaged, and maybe it's working at half speed, you're going to lose a lot of maneuverability in space because your computer won't understand what's going on. Or if you upgrade your IFCS, maybe your ship will be able to turn faster and understand how to get there better, and you might improve your flight characteristics just by changing the, the way the computer thinks. All right, now let's talk about avionics. Now, you would think that the computers would fall into avionics. Well, I've actually separated them into avionics being your communications, which, uh, yeah, I would think that maybe your scanners and your computers all would fall inside the avionics package, but avionics in, can be things like your radio, trying to communicate with ground control, or you're going to dock, or your wingman. All that's part of your avionics. And also what's called, I know this, I, I jumbled all this into basic functions. Uh, basically, everything in your ship that's being ran by the computer that doesn't fall into a specific category, I just lumped them, lumped into something called avionics. All right, next thing is life support. Uh, if you want to live in space, you don't want to always be in a space suit, right? So you're going to have life support systems on your ship. And there's a lot of things that go into life support, and some of those things I actually have in other areas. But these are the main things in life support. You've got your O2 supply. You've got to have oxygen. You just, it's just, that's, you've got to have it. Uh, and, if you get, and if you lose all your oxygen, then you need to put your spacesuit on and make it back to a base station, space station before you run out of air, right? Obviously. Escape pods. I put that under life support because uh, if you like run out of air, you can jump into your escape pod, you can eject, call for help, or you can just lock the escape pod because it's got its own internal air supply uh, waiting for someone to come help you. Then there's, then there's uh, life pods. Okay, um, a life pod is not necessarily the same thing as an escape pod. An escape pod will actually eject out of the ship. A life pod is just that. It's an escape pod that doesn't eject. It's basically in the ship, you lock it up, there is this um, game mechanic where you enter your life pod on your ship and you log out of the game. So when you log back into the game, your ship can be where you left it. And you can, it's like a save game function. So you get in your life pod, you go to sleep, you put yourself in cryo animation, like a, like a, a suspended animation birth. You log out of the game. When you log back in, you wake up from your life pod, you get out, you resume what you were doing. There's a, there's a little skip, uh, uh, speculation on how that function is going to actually work, but that's kind of what they're saying. They're saying that you're going to have these little anim 
cryo animation births that you could enter into and then log out of the game and that way you save your it's just like a save game position even in the persistent universe where otherwise if you logged out your ship would just reappear at the last port of call or something um, I don't think that's going to be a very good function either because some people are going to abuse that instead of having to fly back they can just log out and then log back in and then guess what they're back at their original base station uh, so I don't know how that's going to work okay grav generator there is a device on some of the larger ships uh, like the multi crew ships that create a gravity inside your ship that you where you can walk around in space without having to worry about floating around in space. That can be turned off. That can be adjusted to extra G's or negative G's. So if your crew is all strapped in in the bridge and some pirates are trying to board your ship, you can like go from plus one G to negative one G to plus one G to negative one G and bounce them off your floor and ceiling until they're all dead. I'm excited about that. <laughs> so as a pirate, you need to disable the generator, grab generator, and go in in zero G, or you're going to be abused by the crew. <laughs> okay, inertial dampeners. Okay, there's something called an inertial dampener. It is not part of the grab generator. What it is is a field inside of your ship. It, they're not explaining exactly how this thing is created, but I assume there are plates in the walls and the floor and the ceiling that absorb kinetic energy or inertial your inertia so let's say you're flying at 1000 meters per second which is super cruise you're flying at 1000 meters per second and then you turn the ship around everybody's on the ship walking around having a good time drinking their drinks you turn the ship completely around 180 degrees and you apply full thrust right because you're trying to stop does everyone go flying back to the engine room? You know, you would think so, right? Even with 1G, they still have all their that inertia built up, and they would still fly back and slam into the engines because it's at full throttle. Well, no, you don't, they, they don't move. People don't move because you have an inertial dampener. Now, how much of that does it dampen? probably like 90% of it. So yes, you feel yourself slowing down, you kind of tilt lean a little bit, but you don't go flying back, you know, at the full whatever G's that that if the thruster is thrusting at 4 G's, you know, that's going to defeat the 1 G grav generator and it's going to cause you to fly back and slam in the engines. So, uh, the inertial dampeners when you do that will actually all if you put it into it another game's terms you would never know when you're turning, accelerating, or decelerating in a ship with inertial dampeners if they're good enough. So you will think you're always stationary. And you won't get seasick and all that kind of stuff. Or space sick. And that's an inertial dampener. And where are those located? What do they look like? Not exactly sure yet. Moving on. Okay, weapons. Space is a, space is a dangerous place you're going to have there's going to be people trying to take your junk right you've got you you're a merchant you're out there there's going to be jerk players out there that are just trolls and they're going to try to come and take your stuff you're going to want to fight them off they're going to want to fight you so you're going to need weapons on your ship uh, weapons are not outlawed weapons are encouraged because the UEE can't be everywhere, they want you to have your own defenses. Now, by doing that, by legalizing weapons, it allows bad people, like pirates, easy access to weapons. So, but by giving everybody a weapon, it's like the Wild West. You know, everybody could be a gunslinger if they wanted to be. They just put limits on the types of weapons you can have. They don't want civilians carrying weapons of mass destruction, like nuclear weapons or biological weapons and things like that. Those are heavily controlled by the UE and considered capital crime to possess them. Missiles. You have missiles. You have guns. You have uh, 
lasers, energy weapons of various different types. You have uh, mass drivers. Uh, and there's different ways. You have tractor beams. I put that under weapon listing. Uh, you have different ways to mount these. Uh, but we'll go into all those in just a second. Okay, missiles. There's a variety of different types of missiles and sizes, uh, and and each one has a variety of different categories. You've got scatter missiles. You've got infrared, image recognition, radar. You've got uh, fast missiles, slow maneuverable missiles, high payload missiles. You need to take a look. When you're shopping for missiles, you need to make sure you're getting the kind that fits your play style or your desired type of missile. There's also torpedoes, which are basically missiles just very large. Okay. Uh, you have guns. When I say guns, I'm really talking about ballistic weapons that fire a shell of some kind, a bullet, a shell. Uh, now we have mass drivers, which I don't know, I don't really understand the difference between a mass driver and a gun. Uh, other than the fact that a mass driver is is kind of like a rail gun in a way, in that it fires a shell but doesn't expel um, a cartridge. It uses like an electromagnetic field to, to accelerate. So it's like an, a part it's like a particle accelerator, but on a much smaller level. And a, the a mass driver, a particle or a rail gun would fire like these really small particles where a mass driver fires this huge mass like a 40 millimeter shell you know okay and they could also be explosive so when they hit they could explode or they could be armor piercing or the you know a variety of sabo or whatever uh, so that goes in my next one ammo you can get all different types of ammo for your guns uh, incendiary, not that you'd want that, but uh, you could get incendiary so when it does penetrate, it causes fires inside of a ship. It's not going to really do that on the outside because of the uh, lack of atmosphere. You're going to have shells that are good against shields and they're not good against armor or vice versa. You're going to have uh, shells that are sabo, so you got high penetration, low damage, make small holes. You know, you're going to get all different kinds, and explosive ones, you know, when they hit, they explode. Uh, now, how does that ammo, how do you replace it? Well, you put it in with these things called ammo boxes. They're basically like magazines that you attach to your gun. When I say gun, I mean ballistic gun. Uh, and Or it might have a feed line. So you might have a feed, an ammo feed from your box located in a different location through a feed line to the gun. Uh, a lot of chain guns you might see have a feed line. They have a box next to the gun, but it has like a feed line that takes it to the gun. Uh, lasers, don't really worry about that. You, As long as you've got power in your power plant and it's connected to your lasers, if it hasn't been cut, your lasers will be able to fire. The downside to lasers are the more you fire, the hotter they get. And when they get up to a certain temperature, they could explode, damaging your wherever they're located or they could just shut down and stop working, fry the components inside the laser and it stops firing. So when you're using lasers, even though you've got an unlimited amount of ammo, you have to, and you, you, they also require recharge time. So some lasers fire faster than others. Uh, that remember overclocking could fix a lot of that. Uh, and a good cooling system can help you fire it more often also. Uh, but lasers do overheat. They do get damaged. They can explode. So they, so they have pluses and minuses. Uh, and then there's different ways you can mount both those guns and the lasers. There's something called a turret, which you all know what that is. You know, you get into it. You've got guns mounted on it. You spin around 360, and you start shooting up, down, left, right, up, and everywhere, right? And those can be manned from the cockpit a lot of times or, the, you know, like in a Hornet. Or it could be manned from inside the turret itself, inside a seat inside the turret, you know, like in the Retaliator. There's also something called a gimbal. A gimbal attaches to a fixed location. Let's say you've got a Hornet, right? It's got a wing-mounted gun. And normally it can mount like a size 3 gun. So it's going to fire a size 3. Well, you could take the size 3 gun off 
and you could put a size 3 gimbal on. And if you put a size 3 gimbal on, now you can mount a size 2. It's always one size less. So you can mount a size 2 gun to it now, and now that gun will be gimbaled. And what that means is it will be able to swivel. It has, it's like a pintle mount. It can actually move left, right, up, and down. Uh, and what's good about that is, is your fixed guns always fire straight forward or converged on a point to your front. So you're always going to have to point your nose at your t uh, target and fire that way. Where with a gimbaled mount, you can fly relatively close to your nose, but the gimbals can can turn and swivel and keep up with any maneuvering that your opponent is doing. So it it makes them a little more powerful in the fact that you can get your guns on target better, but by reducing the size, you're actually losing firepower. So if you're a good pilot and you know how to get your nose on target, like myself, fixed guns will let you kill them faster. If you are not a very good pilot and you feel like you um, are all over the place, use gimbals because your guns can stay on target more readily. Okay, uh, what a tractor beam is. A tractor beam, I'm sorry, I jumped back, but a tractor beam is not really a weapon, but it goes on a weapon mount, and what it does is it pushes, it pulls, it moves left, it moves right objects. So think of it like an arm that you could, you've seen it on Star Trek, but just think of it as like an arm, that, an invisible energy arm that reaches out, grabs something, and moves it around. And the better the tractor beam, the more precise you can move things. Uh, so like if you're trying to put stuff in your cargo hold, or uh, if you're trying to recover something heavier, you might need a bigger tractor beam. Um, it's going to use a lot of your energy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, back to the mounts, right? We talked about turrets, gimbals, and fixed mounts. But there's something called a pylon, and there's also something called a rack. Now, pylons can have guns mounted on them, and they can also have missiles mounted on them. Basically, they are extensions of a wing that allow you to mount guns on it, or missiles. A rack is usually a missile mount that mounts multiple missiles. So like if you've got a four missile rack and you mount that on a pylon, you'll have those four missiles. Now you can't have a four missile rack and mount four guns. No, it doesn't work that way, that, as far as I know. All right, let's talk a little bit about defense, defensive systems that your ship's going to have. It's going to have uh, chaff, flares, shields, armor, and I also include ejection seat in there because that's going to that's going to save your life. Okay, chaff. What chaff is is a little it's a little packet of aluminum foil flakes inside like a small explosive charge. So you're flying along, you fire off a chaff, it explodes, it disperses this cloud of aluminum flakes, and I say aluminum, but it could be, who knows what it is, but it, it's metallic flakes, so that when someone is behind you and they have a radar lock, their radar gets confused by this now new cloud of particles, and they lose their lock on you. Now, that's really, its initial primary purpose is when a missile is chasing you, you drop chaff, and now this radar-locked missile loses its lock, and it'll just fly into the chaff, and maybe it'll explode in the chaff, thinking that it's hit the ship, or maybe it'll just fly through the chaff and then try to reacquire your target. Uh, but it's a way to drop chaff, turn, try to get away, confuse the missile. Flare, same thing, but against heat-seeking missiles. Uh, because what it is, is it it's launches this super, super-heated flare out the back of your ship. Now, when that missile or ship that uses infrared to lock onto you is behind you, and that missile's chasing you, you drop that flare, it will 
assume that your flare is your engine and explode there. Or if you are in front of that flare and you throttle up or do a massive major turn causing your ship to boost or use afterburner, you've defeated the purpose of the flare because the, your engine is still now creating more of a signature than that flare. The missile does not lose contact and it runs into your ship. So when you're using flares, be sure not to boost. Don't afterburn, just turn. Drop your flare, turn, maybe 45 degrees, missiles should miss you. Okay, shields. Shields are an electromagnetic bubble around your ship. Depending on the number of generators that your ship has, the number of projector arrays that are around your ship, and the type of shield it is, you could have up to, well, you can have an infinite number. But some of the larger ships are going to have six shields. They're going to have the front, the aft, the port, the starboard, the top, and the bottom. The ventral and the dorsal. You're going to have, uh, or is it dorsal and ventral? Dorsal and ventral, right? So you're going to have six shield emitters. Those are the projector arrays. Uh, some of the good fighters only have four front, back, left, and right, right? When you lose your shields from one of the arrays, left or right, your HUD is going to display that you've lost shields in that, in that section. And you can transfer power from one shield to another. What that does is it takes shield power from one of the arrays and transfers it to another array. Or you could allow your shield generator just to build up more shield power in that area. Um, through my experience, I found that it's easier to roll 180 degrees. <laughs> so let's say I'm flying along and I get attacked from my right, my three o'clock position, and I lose my right shield. My right shield is completely gone. Instead of transferring power or re-energizing that shield, I could roll along my axis, 180 degrees. Now I've presented my left shield to that same opponent while I allow my right shield to regenerate. You get the idea. Okay, so now uh, I've also included armor in this. Armor is, uh, some ships have armor built into the hull, right? Where it's just a armor value. And when people shoot you, they have to penetrate your armor to get into the internal components. Some ships have strap-on armor. That It's a component that you can actually add to your hull to give yourself armor. Now, what's armor going to do? It's going to weigh your ship down. It's going to slow you down. With the new flight model, weight matters. Placement, center of mass matters. So if you have a lot of cargo in the back, your ship's not going to fly the same as if you put all of the cargo in the front. But armor will have weight, it will have an armor penetration value, it will also be, I think, ablative, so when people shoot you, armor flakes will flake off and you'll, it'll reduce your armor in that area, and then they'll be able to penetrate and get to your internal components and start damaging them. Yes, your internal components are on your ship somewhere. They're actually physically modeled in your ship. When you are hit, from a projectile, a laser, or whatever, and it penetrates your hull, it will be calculated to determine where that hit happened, where the path of the trajectory is of the, of the shell. Does it intersect one of your components? If it does, that component will be damaged. If it does not, that component is not damaged. So it, so it behooves you as an attacker to shoot at where places where the components are located. FYI, components, think of it, they're trying to go for a simulator, a realistic simulator as much as they can. Okay, so that, and the last thing was ejection seat. Yeah, and I put it in the defense because when your ship's starting to explode or whatever, you're getting ready to, it's, it can't fly, your guns don't shoot, and you're just trying to get away, uh, you can actually go to self-destruct and then eject, you know? 
if you don't want them to have your ship. You know, then you'll be floating in space at the mercy of whoever comes by to pick you up. So you can use your emergency beacon to call for people, but if they're monitoring that, they'll know exactly where you're at, if, and then they'll come pick you up, and now you're their prisoner. Or you can wait for them to fly off, which might be hours later, and if it is, you might run out of air, so you've got to kind of gamble on how you, wh how and when you want to drop your uh, emergency beacon. And then even if you drop your emergency beacon and you've got it going, does that mean anybody's going to even hear that and respond to you? You don't know. So are you going to delay and wait? Uh, that's a game within a game. All right. Next thing is access. All ships have some way to get into them. Need to. If you don't. It's not a very good ship. Uh, you, fighters, most of the fighters have cockpit that open up. The, cock, the top of the cockpit just opens up. Uh, you also have docking collars. Docking collars are the rings that you'll see, and they're usually a, a standardized size that when two ships uh, pair up together, both their docking collars are the same size, they match up, then you can walk from one ship to the next without being exposed to the elements. An airlock. An airlock is a way to get in and out of your ship without exposing the entire inside of your ship to the elements. So what that means is there's usually two doors. You've got an inner door and an outer door. When you open the outer door, that airlock, primary area in the airlock gets filled with the elements, either vacuum or corrosive atmosphere or whatever. And then when you enter the airlock, and you close the outer door, you vent all the inner uh, elements out, or you pump air in, and then you can open the inner door. So then you walk in. And so, so the people on the inside, they don't have to be in uh, spacesuits or worry about it because both doors are never going to be open at the same time. If they were, that would basically just expose the entire inside of the ship to the elements. That's an airlock. And then you have an elevator. Uh, something like the Constellation has an elevator. The elevator you stand on, it used to be the airlock and the elevator in one. Now it's not. It's kind of like the elevator is part of the airlock, but it's the airlock is actually a, a room or a chamber above the elevator. But okay. What it is is you just stand on an elevator. It lowers you to the planet's surface, and you step off. It's as simple as that. Some elevators are cargo elevators, so you can actually uh, lower your entire cargo load down to the ground so you can unload it. And you can also use that as an access point into your ship if you'd like. Then there's something called a ramp, uh, like the Cutlass and the Freelancer. They both have these ramps on the back where uh, you lower the ramp, and then you can roll things up into the cargo hold. You can walk up it like um, like stairs up into the cargo hold. Uh, what that does is it exposes that cargo hold in its entirety to the elements. So a lot of times you'll not want to use that unless you're inside of a docking bay or if you're in uh, landed on a planet where it has acceptable atmosphere. Or you want to make sure that all your cargo is in sealed compartments apartments because if you open up that ramp in the vacuum and let's say you don't have uh, all your cargo sealed if it suffers from zero pressure then that you know you could ruin your cargo uh, so or if you land on a planet that's got like a corrosive atmosphere and you open up the back hatch all your cargo is going to have that corrosive atmosphere all over it and ruin your cargo so uh, the Cargo ramp is not an airlock, so be careful when you've got uh, valuables in your cargo hold. Now, in space, let's say uh, you're a pirate, you've got Cutlass, and you destroy the ship, and you're trying to take that cargo from their ship to your ship. You can do it through the docking collar. That way, nothing gets exposed. Or you could, like if you blow up the back of the ship and there's cargo laying all around in space, you might as well open the ramp and just bring it in because it's already exposed to the atmosphere so, or the uh, vacuum. So uh, either way, it's okay. All right, so now the last thing. Uh, nope, not the last thing. Or is it the last thing? It is the last thing. Basics. Okay. 
this is something that I, I couldn't really figure out where else to put them on the component list, but they're still components on your ship. One is called the cooling and cooling heat sinks. Okay, specifically lasers, power plants, engines, they all get hot and they need, and computer systems, they all get hot and they need a way to be cooled off. Okay, so uh, a lot of times you'll have like a heat pump that's pumping the heat out, uh, or they'll have a heat sink, which is basically like a radiator. Uh, these things can be better or worse, and you can overclock them. Basically, different types of gel that you might put in your heat sink pipes, or uh, the radiator might be made out of a specific metal as opposed to another metal, so it actually dissipates heat better, and vice versa. Okay. Next one is the hull. Yes, I said the hull. The hull is a component. It is one of the most important components. It's what holds and binds everything. Okay, it, it actually holds everything together, right? Without your hull, all your components would just be floating in space separately. So if you, let's say you're in a dogfight and you get a bunch of holes in your hull and you go land. Well, you got to replace it. You got to replace the hull or you got to repair it. So can you overclock it? Sure, I don't know. Maybe you can get a hull that's a little bit bigger. Maybe you can get a hull that has an extra door or maybe a hull that allows you to have a different turret on it or something. There's yeah, possibilities are endless. Okay, a bulkhead. A bulkhead is a hull inside your hull. It's a wall. A bulkhead, okay, here it is. A bulkhead is a wall inside your ship that is airtight. If it is airtight, it's considered a bulkhead. If it is not airtight, because there are there can be walls inside your ship that are not airtight. I don't see a whole lot of that in the game, but it might exist. Like, uh, uh, I know on the Horizon spaceport, uh, there were a lot of walls that I looked at that couldn't possibly be airtight. You know, so those would just be considered partitions or walls, where the bulkhead is actually separates sections of a ship. Like in a constellation, you've got four components. You've got the cockpit, you have the neck, you have the cargo hold, and you have the tail. And each one of those is separated by a bulkhead. Now, in that bulkhead, you're going to have a door, of course, because without it, you wouldn't be able to transition from one to the other. But there's going to be a door. So, like, if you get a big hole blown in your cargo hold, you're not going to have air escaping from the neck or the bridge because the bulkhead is there to protect you. That's the bulkhead. Conduits and pipes. Absolute last subject. Okay. You're going to see lots of pipes and conduits all over your ship. And yes, they're a component, and yes, they probably will have to be replaced and repaired, but I think that conduits and pipes are going to be included in like a general repair fee. So like when you land and you need to replace some pipes, they'll say, you know, 750 United Earth credits and all your pipes will be repaired. Okay, or something like that. It'll be just a value. Um, I don't think you'll actually say, here I am going to go replace this water pipe with another water pipe. I'm going to go replace the fuel pipe with another fuel pipe. I don't think that's the way. They're not going to get that micromanaging in there. But they might. You never know. Okay, but that's what a conduit, a conduit holds wires, like from your computer system to your maneuvering system to your flight system to the life support system. Those all need to be communicating to your computers. And then pipes actually carry physical items like fuel or coolant or air, you know. And uh, so you'll see a lot of those. You'll see pipes and you'll see conduit. Now the pipe system that you hear about in all the ships includes conduits in that system. They consider a conduit to be a pipe, even though it's technically not. But uh, if they talk about an electronic pipe, that's technically a conduit. All right, now I think I've gone over everything about a ship, all the different things you might find on the ship, all the components that you might be able to modify, overclock, swap out, adjust. I might have missed some, plus they might add some later. 
but this should be real exciting. There's a lot of different options here. I'm going to put a list. Uh, I'm going to put a list of all these in my notes below in the comments. So please, uh, if you if I missed one or if I forgot to talk about something, please post that in the comments below so that other people might be able to read your comments. And you guys are the greatest audience that I've had. So share this with your friends, let them know, post it on your website, let people know about all these different components. And finally, First Naval Aerospace Squadron is looking for people that are excited about Star Citizen, want to team up and play as a team, enjoy uh, role playing, maybe a little bit of that, maybe a little bit of exploration, uh, preventing piracy, uh, everything related to what you might expect from a naval squadron. Uh, so check us out at 1nas.engine.com and or on the RSI site under the orcs as 1NAS. And if you're interested, send me an invite. And I'd love to have you join our squad. See you guys.